Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Build Your Copywriting Business Podcast. Hey there, Kate. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, an extra, an extra hello. exciting hello. Hello, <laughs> hello, hello. Um, today, we are going to dig into very, very common ways that copywriters leave money on the table. Uh Considering that all of us got into copywriting to start a new career at one point or another, it was a solid 20 plus years ago for me, Um, but we all get into it to make money as a business to support ourselves. Um, Any money that we're leaving on the table or we are forgetting to factor in or missed opportunities, that just undercuts our goal of having a free, exciting, fulfilling life. And really what we're getting down here, get down to here is a list of things that you very easily could fail to factor in when you are pricing out projects for your clients. I think especially uh, newer copywriters, but even some of us, we get into bad habits. Uh, Mm. We think, all right, well, how long is it going to take me to write this? Okay. Yeah. I'm probably like uh, maybe an hour of a meeting. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe a round or two of edits and maybe that's going to take and we think, all right, that's great. I multiply it by my my desired hourly rate. You're like, well, you know, it kind of <laughs> it gets looser and looser the longer that you yeah. are in. Uh, the longer that you're like, oh, I kind of charge something similar to that. Anyway, uh, CCA students, you know that there's a, a much more straightforward system for pricing out your project. But um, but just factoring those three things, like, well, a meeting and uh, do some writing and some editing is actually forgetting about a lot of things that can end up taking a lot of time when you add them all together. Yeah. Like, and I think that the other thing to think about is like five minutes here, 10 minutes here. You're like, oh, whatever, whatever. That All of that time over the course of a year adds up to hours and hours and hours and hours. Trust me, I used to not charge for oh, they just needed this little thing. It took me five minutes. And that was the biggest mistake in terms of leaving money on the table. My valuable time. It's time that went to the project. Why Why wasn't I factoring it in? And so um, all of these things, even if you think, well, uh, if, if there any been, ever been points of like, oh, but that was that was so easy. Yeah, but you, that's their, again, like copywriting might be easy to you in some ways. And like, oh, they're really going to hire a writer, someone who like, yeah, you, you like writing. And so that goes for all of these little things, too. That's just like, oh, it's just this little thing. Well, no, it's part of mm-hmm. your service. It's part of your profession. It's part of what they're paying you to do. Yeah, so, exactly. You don't need to do them any favors. I know that sometimes yeah. it's like, well, I'm going to do this for them. And and yes, certainly there can be. But if you're if you're just shooting out an email, they're not even realizing that you're doing something special for them. And it's, you're not, you didn't factor it into the cost, right? It's not like if, if you're going to do something special for your client, make sure they know that it's something special. Like if, if a client says, oh, I know that you said that you need to get this on, you need that you, that the, the due date is this day. Is there any way you could get it done early? Yeah. There may be some times where you think, you know what? I really love this client. And you can say, you know what? I, I'm I'm not always going to be able to do that, but this week I can rearrange a few things and get this done uh, on the date that you need it. Um, but again, I'm happy to do that. I love working with you. This week I can make it happen, but I can't guarantee that can happen in the future. If you're going to do something special for a client, let them let them know that it's something special instead of being like, "Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do this for." I'm just gonna them. break my boundaries yes. and make them think that that's normal. Yeah, I'm going to give away stuff for free that they won't even no. realize they're not paying for. No, no, yeah. absolutely. On top of the fact that there's also the cost of task switching. When we think, all right, I'm yeah. just going to send a five-minute email, you're stopping whatever task you were doing, going in, putting together your email. Maybe you have to look some stuff up. Maybe you have to do a little bit of thinking, writing that email, and then you have to completely switch to a totally different task, which requires a different part of your brain, and it takes as much as like, it's only five minutes. That's not how humans operate. We don't do one task for five minutes. Then we immediately start the next task. And then we immediately start the next task. We, we, it takes the human brain a little bit of time to transition into different projects. And if you're transitioning from an email, even if it's an email about the same project, I sent an email to the client about this project, and now I'm going to sit down and work on the project. It's taking some time to get into the right mindset for that. And that's, if that's, let's even just be generous and say it's only five minutes, but that's still another five minutes that works out to be hours and hours over the course of your year. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so I think one of the things, first things to do is set up. I think this is a great rule to have for your business. I used to only, it was like a, a quarter of an hour. I'm not going to like five and 10 minutes here. I'm not going to do m- that micro math. There's no way I'll do quarter of an hour. And then I bumped it up to every half an hour because of that task switching and because of what I noticed that, oh, my valuable time, there are hours just getting sucked that I don't know where they went. And it's not that I wasn't doing work. It's just that these, that task switching is very real, that time to, to move between things and just like even opening up a window to send the email and all like, by the time you actually sit down and do it, it's all of these minutes that are starting to add up. And so set that rule for yourself. What are, I know people that do to the hour, like I'm not going to charge less than for me. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I'm not comfortable, especially if it truly is there, there are little things I do for my clients where it's like, well, no, that is truly a 15, 20 minute task. Okay. I'll round up to the half an hour. Um, but for it's your business. Um, Mm -hmm. but keep that in mind of, I would, I would never get in the habit of saying, okay, I'm going to do seven minutes or whatever it is. You don't have to get that granular. Mm -hmm. Well, and even like, and we have a a whole list we'll give you guys, um, Mm -hmm. but in just a moment, um, but even before we get into that, just the idea of, of scheduling out your writing time. You know, if you, if you genuinely think it's going to take you one hour to write something, this is just, maybe it's eight hours, maybe whatever, but remember too, that you're not going to sit down at your computer, open that computer up, put Mm -hmm. your keys, put your fingers on the keys and immediately start writing. Any project that we're working on, there's going to be a little bit of time that you're kind of, you're sitting down to your computer and you're kind of acclimating. You think, all right, well, let me review what I did yesterday. Or let me, uh, let me review the creative brief. Let me, and even if you've already done your outlining, even if you've already done your concepting, it's going to take a little bit of time to get your brain in the space for writing that copy. And it's going to happen with every single session. If you are, if you're working on a project that you estimate is going to take you eight hours of actual writing time, and you're splitting that out over, you know, four days, so two hours a piece, there's going to be time at the beginning of each of those four hours that you need time to kind of get your brain into it. And if you're only charging for, for eight hours, but, or you're only estimating for eight hours, but it's actually taking you closer to maybe nine just to to get yourself in the mode of writing, then again, that's more time. If it's part of the process, it's something that you should be charging for, I guess is what we're coming down yes. to. Yeah. Yeah. So should we dig into our list? Let's dig into our list. Yes. Uh the first thing, and I think this is maybe going to surprise people is the discovery call. And you think, well, how do I charge for the discovery call if they don't end up being the client? Well, if they don't end up being your client, then of course, you know, you know, the discovery call you're not going to charge for. Uh, But if they end up being your client, rolling that into the project price, because you spent valuable time with that client, I'm sure on that discovery call, you're getting information, you're, you're talking about potential projects, you're, you're, sharing strategies or ideas or guiding them in the right direction. All of that is valuable things that you're doing on that call. And if they end up being your client, that's then time that you put toward that project. That is that is kind of the start of the project. Mm-hmm. And if it wasn't the start of a project, maybe it's the start of the project in the future. And so keeping a record of past clients, because they might come back, you might do a discovery call with someone. And then, you know, a year from then they they come back. And so roll that time into. And of course, you, yeah, maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's a half an hour, maybe it's 45 minutes or an hour, whatever mm-hmm. it is, make sure you're tracking that time and accounting for it and and billing for it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I would even say that every discovery call makes you a better copywriter, whether you get the work mm-hmm. or not. So if you, you know, if you, you land one out of every every four discovery calls or one out of every two discovery calls. I'm not saying that you should then charge your client for two hours for a discovery call, but maybe you can charge them for Mm -hmm. an an hour and 15 minutes because again, and well, but I, I wasn't on the phone with them. So it's no, but every discovery call that you're, you are learning new things, you're becoming a better copywriter and you are gaining experience that you can bring into that interaction with your client. So Definitely factor in the discovery call, the discovery call process with that client, but maybe also too think about factoring in a, a small portion of the other discovery calls that you've had that have that have increased your skills, experience, and abilities. Well, to that point, yeah, it's it, that's like research and prep work in some ways. It's part of 
what you're doing beforehand to come to that call prepared. So you've done other mm -hmm. things to prepare. And frankly, if you're doing, you've likely done research on this client to come prepared with ideas. And so all of that time too, I would account for as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that kind of gets then into the into the project process. Yes, the discovery call is time, but then also the the initial input call, the kickoff call where you're getting mm -hmm. all of that information from your client. You are making them probably do do deeper thinking about um, about the the project itself. And actually, it, I apologize because I even skipped a step. The time that you put in to figure out how much this project is going to cost you, right? The with the time that you put into the estimate, because that you're doing work too. You're thinking through the project, you're figuring out the order in which you want, you, you should do things, um, how long it's going to take you, all of that kind of thing. So factor in both the, the time that it takes you to come up with the, the quote, uh, and yes, the time it takes you to send the quote, it's only five minutes, the time it takes you to send the quote. Also, you might want to add in a little bit more time if if you none of us are psychic, right? You can't know in advance which clients are going to get back to you right away and say, yes, absolutely, I'm ready to go. Or the other clients who you're going to have to follow up with a couple of times to get them to say, okay, yes, now totally finally ready to go. But if you have to follow up with a client two or three times to finally get them to say, oh yeah, now, now is the time. That's also all time that that can be factored in. And again, you might not, we're nobody's psychic. Well, maybe some people are psychic. I like to believe. Anyway, that's a me thing. No, um, no. I like to, not we aren't. Uh, and if you are, good for you. But uh, you can't always tell in advance which client is going to be a little bit more difficult. But when you, again, try to spread that out across multiple clients, it's going to, in the long run, just make up for the clients who are a little bit slower in response or that you have to chase them down a little bit more so. Uh, so estimate time, sending your quote, and then also the input time, the, the, any research that you have to do and any, uh, any time on that input call. And then two, time consolidating your notes from the input call. Yeah, I think and a lot of this falls into kind of like admin bucket, but it's all admin for a particular project. So keep that in mind. If you're doing work, that relates to anything, always look at, I think of the time I spent in an agency and it was like, they were like, we can't have non-billable work, like, cause then we're not making money. And it was like, oh yeah, duh. like I'm doing this in service of this project. So therefore, or maybe I'm doing something in service of multiple projects, but okay. So then 50, 50 for my time, 50% of my time is going towards this 50% of the time is going to this or other project. They were masters at having very, very few unbillable hours. So think of that for yourself too. You shouldn't have that many unbillable hours if yeah. you're sitting at your desk doing work for your copywriting business. Yeah. And so, um, you know, depending on your system and what you do, I would say if you're the type of person who's, we, our team uses Asana for, for task management. I do that for my freelance work too, just to have what things are on my, on my, um, what tasks and deadlines and, and what projects are, are happening. Uh, same thing with your calendar is you're inputting into your calendar of meeting times, meeting dates, all of that sort of thing. If you're kind of managing the project on your end, you want to account for that time. But also if you end up being kind of like playing the project manager role for your clients of, to Nikki's point, chasing down the quote, but also chasing down, hey, I just wanted to remind you, you know, uh, feedback is due on this date, all of those emails and communication aspects throughout the entire project. So, um, you know, uh, touching base, if you have a really long project, you know, that's going to take you a couple of weeks, you might check in halfway and just say, Hey, just want to update you that, you know, here's where things stand, or you send it and you say, Hey, just want to update you. I know you, we said we had a week to, to turn around feedback. I just want to check in, make sure if you had any questions, um, Anything like that, that you are sending emails or maybe you're following up and you say, hey, I know we had this kickoff. I have a, I have a few more additional questions that I need to ask as I dug in that I, ha I have questions on. There are a lot of emails that might come up during the, the course of a project. And I think we underestimate just how much time communication, effective, good communication takes. And so you want to build in and bill for all of all of those hours because it does it does add up to hours of your time. Yeah, exactly. You know, and a lot of the other things that that we'll mention, like Kate was saying, seem like admin, like, oh, right, well, um, account onboarding, um, account auditing, okay, you know, all of this kind of stuff. But think of it too, 
if you don't have experience in an agency, you may be like, well, I don't know, billable hours. I don't know. Like, if you were in an office and this was your job, it's not like the time that you spent doing the research or the time that you spent chasing somebody down to get in. It's not like you, the company would say, oh, we're not paying you for that. Of course, they would still pay you for that. It's part of the job. Um, so the even if it's not literal writing or editing or taking someone through a the the um, doing a, a creative review of your project, it still counts. It's still part of the job. And as such, because it's part of the job, you should be getting paid for it. Yeah. And you mentioned a uh, creative review. That's another meeting yeah. to, to account for is you're taking your client through the review of your work. And some folks, you know, if you've worked with a client for a very long time and it's a smaller project, maybe you're creating a loom video for that to walk them through and, and explain kind of the choices you made and why you made them. That's all of that, whether it's a meeting, whether you do a loom, whatever you're doing for that review is all time to account for. And I think Along with that, the the feedback that often we have to chase down as copywriters, I know I mentioned that with emails that you're sending and to remind, hey, just reminding that feedback's due at this point, um, all of that time. But then your editing time too, we recommend you doing project-based work because there's no reason to penalize yourself for not having edits from a client, especially as you go on in your career and you just knock things out of the park on the first try, um, or maybe the client's just really easy to please, which is lovely. Um, you never know what a client's going to be like. Yes, you might have rounds of feedback. Um, and But the, the point is that you should be factoring in a couple of rounds of edits of what that time would take into all of your project rates so that you are getting compensated for it. If you do a really good job and they don't need all of that time and they end up getting final copy faster, that is a benefit to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you're penalizing yourself if you're not factoring in that time to say, well, I'm just going to do it right the first time and and it'll be great. Um, no, you should be <laughs> getting paid for the fact that you're doing it really, really well the first time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, but I don't know in advance of a project, how many rounds it's going to be, or how many times I'm going to have to send emails to them, or how much I'm going to have to chase them down, or how many meetings. No, of course you can. Back to that that not being psychic. But there are a couple of things to consider. Number one, the more projects you have, the more you start to you'll start to get a sense for it. You know, you you'll do a project and you go and tr track your time too. Mm -hmm. That's another big tip from us that yes. we actually do regularly when we start to go. I feel like my schedule is getting a little out of control. Let me track my time and see where this time mm -hmm. is going. But track your time. If you did, uh, you know, you worked on a project and you go, oh wow, I actually spent two hours sending emails from this client, then, okay, next time going into a project, all right, it's going to be a, a roughly a similar size project, maybe even a little bit more, factor in those hours for emails. Each project that you take, you will learn something that will help you with the next, uh, the next quote, the next estimate for how long something is going to take you. Um, and yes, it, you may end up estimating something is a, will take you a little bit more time than it actually does take you. To Kate's point, you're welcome, client. I did it faster. You got it easier or better or not better, but but uh, smoother than than even any of us estimated. But remember, too, that if they agreed to when they agree to a price, when they agree to a project price, they agree to to two thousand dollars for this project. What they are agreeing to is two thousand dollars for an end result with which they are thrilled. It's a happy end result. How you allocate that number to get there is not their business, that's your business. So mm -hmm. if you end up spending a ton of time on writing, or even if you end up spending, even if you end up spending a lot less time to actually do the project, it doesn't matter because what they're paying for is that end result, not the individual hours to get there. You yeah. to do your own to, to come up with the estimate. You are using that. You are you are factoring all of that in to help you get to that end number to make sure that it will be both fair for you and your client. But they're not paying you for the hours. They're paying you for the end result. Yeah, and I think maybe we should have started with this by saying you're not breaking any of this down on your scope of work. You are still breaking down your scope of work to say I'm going to deliver an about page, uh, a five email welcome series, or whatever it is. Um, you're not breaking down discovery call time this many hours, email communication mm -hmm. time this many hours. They don't, they don't need to know that. They don't need mm -hmm. to feel like they're getting nickel and dime. All of that stuff is wrapped up into delivering 
to Nikki's point, the end result. All of this mm-hmm. communication, the admin is part of delivering a great about page or a great email series or a great insert, whatever the project is. All of these things happen behind the scenes to deliver mm-hmm. that. Yes. And the vast majority of clients don't want to know yeah. the line items. They just want to know how much it's going to cost you. In fact, and they just for want me, a great service too. Yes, like they just exactly. want you to do it and do it well. Yes. Get get me my – because all they care about is the end result. Yes, the process of getting there too. They want you to be communicative. They don't want you to, to disappear on them. They want you to be good to work with. But the actual hour breakdown, the vast majority of clients don't want to know. And actually, I would even say too that – it's probably like once in a blue moon, once of a, out of every maybe 30 clients mm-hmm. that says, oh, well, how did you get to this number? What's the, because they're yeah. looking for ways to get it from you. They, they want to know. They're looking for ways to, to get, your, get your price down a little bit. Like, oh, well, you estimate this many numbers for editing and we can do editing in, in-house, whatever. The, 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 it's, it's absolutely a yellow to orange flag for me if a client wants to know what yeah. goes into my project price. That's none of their business. And if someone did ask, I'd say, well, abs- you know, let me know what, you, what your concerns are. Mm-hmm. Or if they say, well, this is just higher than we were hoping to pay, then you say, all right, well, what was your budget for this project? And then you go into the negotiation process. It is never, you are never under obligation to show people the, to, well, this peel back the is curtain. not going anywhere. Thank you. Throw back the curtain. Yeah. Yes. They don't uh, need to a show, behind the scenes tour of to yeah, show how them you get the, your prices. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> to show them the recipe of what's in the cake. Yeah. Most yeah. clients don't care. They want the cake. They don't need to see what's in the recipe. I know. I, I don't want to know what's in the recipe because I don't want to know how much sugar and how many egg yolks went into that cake. Don't just tell me, me the calorie yeah, count. Just, just give, give me, me the, the cake. Give me the cake. Exactly. Um, Another thing to think about as you progress in your copywriting career too is if you are outsourcing projects. So if you are hiring someone, whether it's a VA to do do some of this admin work or it's someone uh, who's a junior copywriter who's going to be taking on some elements of the project, whatever it is, you want to make sure you you know what you're paying them and you know exactly kind of the the profit you want to make from from this what is is that Mm -hmm. so okay you have your rate their rate is that the margin and then the time that they're going to take the time that you might have to take to get them review the work exactly Mm -hmm. review the work get them up to speed on the project kind of uh maybe give them feedback and maybe they have rounds of revisions internally uh so all that time if you're outsourcing to to really dig into those numbers and make sure that it's it, it, it's going to be a great, again, end result for client. It's going to be a great end result for you in terms of, you know, you're not outsourcing work to to break even or to lose money on the project. So you want to really make sure that you have those numbers dialed in and it all makes sense. Mm-hmm. Exactly. When you get to the point, if you get to the point that you you're outsourcing, to, yeah. if you want to, you are outsourcing to give yourself more bandwidth to take on more projects because more projects means more income. And if you can outsource some of the other projects to a junior, even a a mid-level writer, certainly, or senior, uh, it's up to you. Um, But you're not doing it to, to, to Kate's point, you're not trying to break even, you're trying to get yourself more opportunity for more income. And you do that by essentially becoming like a little copy agency, not mm-hmm. a full on agency, but, but when you outsource in that way, um, and that's a whole other topic, but, uh, definitely something to consider as you're, you're factoring in all of your costs. Yeah. Yeah. And clients should be used to it. If they're hiring you again, it's all about what end result are they getting? And if you're going about it this way in an agency format, then they, again, they don't need to know. They just want, they want a great, great final product. And mm-hmm. so Mm-hmm. Exactly. And one of the last things too, at the the very end of the project, this is, I don't know why I, my least favorite part of a project is invoicing, which is hilarious because I want to get paid. I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just done with the project and I want the money to come fall off the tree. Uh, but it, till, <laughs> till that day comes, I have to send an invoice. And so, um, even if you have some kind of invoicing software or whatever, you, there's still something to be done there. Um, I frankly still just send, it's a Word doc I save out as a PDF, folks. No finance department really gives a what your invoice looks like. So <laughs> to that point, though, it's it's super easy, but it takes it takes time and it takes some like, okay, hey, what... What were the what am I billing and what was it? What did I do? And dude, like all of those sorts of things that just I drag my exactly. Feet. 
tracking that you sent it, yep. putting it in your tracking sheet, exactly. following up, all yep. that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yes. The tracker. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so that, honestly, at the end of a month, that could take 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how many clients you have, how many invoices you're sending, what you're doing. And so, um, you know, there's one client I work with, like, like there's a purchase order number and then there's a certain thing I have to put in the subject line. And then there's like a certain, there's all these steps I have to follow. So I bring up that document to make sure I'm following the steps. It's a very large organization, very bureaucratic, and they have a very set system, which I appreciate. I get it. I get paid. Um, but you might have this. I think a lot of us think, well, I just, I have a system and like, that's great. I have a system too, but often a lot of my clients, the bigger companies have their own system. And so each invoice is a little bit different. And then it becomes this whole process. I'm not just, I can't just use my own processing software that I want. Um, but all that's to say, just, just taking out my rage on invoicing on this, this moment here, um, account for that time. (laughs) Bill for that time. Mm -hmm. I used to get really, I get less upset now because I'm like, oh, I'm getting, I already accounted for this time that Mm -hmm. I don't love doing. Um, But it feels Mm -hmm. a lot better when I know I'm getting paid for it. And it is, again, it's part of the project. I need to, it's the final kind of cherry on top of the project to send Mm -hmm. that invoice. And Mm -hmm. they want the invoice because they want to close their books out. You know, they've, it's on their books, accounts payable. And they're like, okay, can you send us the invoice? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes, Well, and and actually, that's that's one more point that um, we're going to wrap up. And then it occurred to me that there's Ooh. one other additional fee that sometimes I will add in. Oh, yes. yes I think I you know, know what it's going to be. Yes. Um, yes. When you work with a client and and they're okay, but maybe they maybe they drag their feet or maybe they oh. make things just more difficult than you have another and, one that i was thinking of oh yes. well then i yeah, want to hear yeah, yours yeah. too yeah um maybe they're they're dragging they, they just make it a little bit more difficult yep. or there's somebody on the team who you have to you get emails from them and you think all right <sighs> i they they're just they're not a professional writer i'm sure this is not the tone they meant if you have a client and first of all you don't have to work with clients you dislike yep you can always find new clients. However, there have been times in my career when I'm like, mm, they're a really good client. They're consistent. I like how mm-hmm. they pay. And this annoys me, but not enough for me to cut this client loose. Then if you want to, you can instill a, what I call a, a PIA tax, a pain in the rear end tax. And maybe I, maybe it's an additional fee, but again, it's all in my project fee Mm -hmm. and they agree on it. So they're happy to pay that fee, but it's, it's part of it. And it makes me feel a little bit better. Every time I get an email from that contact who comes across as smarmy or comes across as, as I don't know, whatever, I know that they're paying for that. And mm-hmm. again, it's not something huge. I'm not doubling the cost, although certainly if they agree to it, I could. But it just, it helps make it a little more palatable when I'm working on a project and I don't love every element of of parts of that project. Mm-hmm. So the fee I was thinking of, um, and I have never taken credit cards as payment myself. Um, all of my clients have a system for invoicing and payments. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you are taking, um, you know, like, uh, wave or whatever software you're using PayPal. Yes. Um, if there's a fee attached to it, like, you know, 2% or whatever, roll that into your product when you're figuring out your project costs and you're like, okay, I'm going to invoice for this at the end and it's going to have this fee. Okay. Suddenly the project cost just goes up just slightly to cover that fee. And so you're not paying for this your convenience. Yes. yes. This is a convenience for your clients that you're offering. Again, I don't offer it because I'm like, I don't, I don't need to. It's not a must. Um, so, but you are, and that's great. And it makes it easy for them. Great. That ease is something that they are mm-hmm. then paying you mm-hmm. for. They're paying you for yeah. ease. It is a service to them. It is a valuable thing that you are offering. Mm-hmm. So make sure and you again, compensate for it. Exactly. It's not a line item. You're not saying right. this is two thousand dollars plus a two percent processing fee. That's not what right. you're doing. You are billing, but that's factored in. It's in that two thousand dollars, whatever the, the whatever amount it is, whatever that full price that you give them. But it's factored in because there's no reason that you should be paying PayPal's fee or Waves fee or whatever to do the work. That should mm-hmm. go back to your client. That's oh, that's a good one. I'm glad you remember that one, Kate. Yeah. See, I'm thinking about PIA clients. And, no, that was a good one too. Because that is that I've I've used the PIA, and then I'm like, well, should all my rates be this? And I'm like, no. Then I just move their PIA higher. You know. 
it's just, yeah. Or you get a little bit, you're like, wait, actually, this should be my rate. I, yeah, and exactly. now I need to think about raising my rates. Higher, exactly. A higher yeah. PAA rate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Or just a higher sta- standard client rate, right. um, which is a whole other topic. And we'll link to, uh, we'll link to when and how to raise your rates. Mm-hmm. Um, but hopefully we gave you a lot of stuff to think about in this episode. A lot of stuff that you are already doing that you may be doing effectively for free because mm-hmm. you didn't factor it into your project cost. And we did not get into this business to do anything for free. If you want to do things for free, great. Then maybe you take pro bono clients, you know, work for, do some work for charities. Although plenty of charities can't afford to pay you as well. But you see what I'm saying. You, if you want to do pro bono work, then do pro bono work. That's great. Or if you want to volunteer somewhere, volunteer somewhere. But this is your business. And mm-hmm. this is one of those opportunities to to take off your, I'm just a freelancer. I'm a writer. And go, okay, now wait a second. I'm going to put on my CEO hat or maybe your, your CFO hat and go, well, let's look at the actual work that we did. Mm, we did all this work for the client. So we need to make sure that the client is paying for us. Yes. As a freelancer, as a writer, as sometimes we get caught up in our emotion and fear and, and, and self-doubt and all that kind of thing. But as business owners, we have to step back from that, put on the CFO ha- hat and look at our actual numbers and make sure that we are getting paid for all of the work that we're doing. Cause a business is not going to succeed and thrive if it's not getting paid for all the work that it's doing. Yeah. And I think one last thing to think about too, is I think a lot of us think, well, why isn't there just a rate for how much emails cost and how much this costs? Like why, why isn't it just so straightforward? And if you've heard this talk before, and we'll link to some other episodes that might be helpful, but every project really is different. Every client's different. Every copywriter is different. And so I think the mindset that I would adopt and it has really, really helped me. This happened. Um, I went to Morocco years ago and the person, a local there was talking to us just about, you know, haggling and negotiation and whatnot. And cause I was like, I was struggling with it of like, this is how am I haggling? And like, they're getting a way better rate cause they're a local and I'm a tourist and they see me and I'm a tourist and it's going to be jacked up and ugh, how unfair, how, how, and I think that's where this feeling comes from of copywriters too. How unfair that like this could be this and this could be, and it feels so different. If you think about it though, of like, I'm happy with this rate for this work that I delivered my client and my client is also happy. It's a mutual exchange. Then that's all that matters. So blocking out everything else, it's between you and this particular client on this particular project, because it might be completely different with that same client on a next project. You worked with them, you realized different things, or it's just a different project or whatever. And so just you need to be happy with your project price Mm -hmm. in the end. And if you're mm-hmm. not, then you learn from that and you adjust it for the next time. Uh, but to compare, and we talk about this too all the time of like comparison, you know, it's it doesn't do you any favors. It just makes you, it's going to make you miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think with with pricing in particular, if you're satisfied and it's it's hitting your goals and it's, you know, okay, this is, this is hitting my rate and maybe they didn't even have any edits. So I, I ended up making this actually per hour of my time and really just taking a time to continuously check in with your numbers and making sure you're happy with them. You're going to just have a lot. It's, it's going to be a much more satisfying experience throughout your career. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. The, the comparison trap is, is a, is a tricky one, you know, and you'll see, you see copy or like, Oh, this copywriter on their website, they say they charge. I still remember this. There was mm-hmm. something I saw that a copywriter is like, I t- charge $10,000 for a homepage. And I, I think even at this was probably like a decade ago, I was like, wow, should I, wow, am I, should I be mm-hmm. charging more? And again, this, this, I have been doing this for a yeah. long, long time. And it kind of made me think, Whoa, wait a minute. And then I realized just because this woman says she's charging $10,000 for a homepage doesn't mean anybody's actually paying it. Yeah. You can say all kinds of things, but it doesn't mean people are actually paying it. And it's also, it doesn't mean that anybody is, if somebody did pay it, it doesn't mean they're getting, they're, they're getting any better results. Exactly. Or that they're then going to work with her for more because they may go, I paid 10 grand for this. I need mm-hmm. to find someone else to do the rest of it for for cheaper or whatever. But I, I agree. The what it all comes back down to is am I do I feel content, happy with this, with what I made for this project? And if the mm-hmm. answer is yes, 
awesome, good for you. You are meeting your goals. You are successful. And if my answer is no, then, okay, what did we learn from this project that we can take into the next one? The Maybe one of the most frustrating parts of this is that, no, there is no perfect formula for knowing exactly how much to charge. There just isn't. I wish, we wish there was something we could give you. We really and truly do. Yeah, but anybody use who those tries, calculators, you know those calculators yeah. are bogus. I think I've talked exactly. about it on the podcast before. I plugged in like number of years of copywriting experience. And I think it went out to 10 years. So I was like, okay, it's over 10 years of experience. I dialed it all the way up. How many uh, you know websites have you done, written in your career? And I was like, definitely hundreds at this point. And it propped out, I think it was something like $13,000. And I was like, well, okay. And maybe someone's okay charging that. Maybe there would be a project where it made sense for me to charge that much, but very, mm-hmm. very potentially. You know, I think honestly, once I got close with it, but it was like a 30 page website, you know, and some pages yeah. were small again, but you don't know, 30 pages. What does that even mean? Some of the pages could scroll, 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 scroll for years and years and years. It's all, but yeah. all that's to say is that calculator was wildly unhelpful because it had no idea what kind of website project I was writing. It had no context Mm -hmm. for the client Mm -hmm. or the pages and what they looked like and what the actual content needed to be on the pages. So whether the client was, was forthcoming with information or whether you had to guide them and help them understand what the project was going to be. It's, there's so many different factors that it, the calculators it, yes, are so useless. They so seem long. like an easy thing, but they're so yeah. useless. So useless. And it, it may seem a little bit daunting that each pro- you have to figure out the cost for each project, but it's actually a good thing because there would be times when a calculator yeah. would say, oh, you're uh, one welcome email, you should charge $300. And you actually look at a project and you go, actually, this is a really impactful email. Mm-hmm. I have to go in and I have to fix a lot of stuff. I also have to guide them to think this through. The, and it, and it, it should be a much more expensive project because it's going to have so much more of an impact or it's going to be a longer project or any one of those things. You should be getting paid for all of your time. And that is the problem with calculators, with trying to offer a package or anything like that. It's every project is going to be different. Every client is different and every experience is going to be different. And like we keep saying, keep all of this stuff in mind so that you can just learn with each project. Every, I mean, not exactly every project, but every, every almost every project is going to get a little bit easier yeah. to estimate. Yes. But again, you're you've billing been... for the estimate. You're, you're yes, taking yes. time. You're, bill, you're factoring this into your cost. So even if exactly. it does take you half an hour to figure it out, great. That's time exactly. you're rolling into the quote. And and will there still be times, even when you're 20 years in, that you oh, go, yeah. yeah, I think it's going to cost you this much. Or I think it's going to, it's not just going to cost you. But yeah, I think this is a reasonable, a reasonable price. And then it ends up taking much longer. Yeah, yeah, that's still going to happen. But that's also just part of the learning curve. Every time that that happens to me, which again, it's not that often anymore. It's pretty rare. But I go, oh, you know what? I saw this red flag and I ignored it. Yeah, And I should have known that that means that they were going to drag their feet or they were going to move slowly or that the organization was a little bit more uh, complicated than, you know, all of those kinds of things. But it's, mm-hmm. it's a learning experience. And the more that you do it, the better you will get at it. Also, by the way, the more that you do at it, the, the more you do it, the more money you're going to make. So you, it's a learning experience and you're getting paid to learn. Yay. Okay. So lots of stuff to think about. Um, if you, this would be a great time, quite frankly, unless you're driving, um, to go back and list out all of these items so that as you are thinking about putting together your quotes for your clients, your your proposals for your clients, you can refer to this list, go down the checklist and not just factor in editing, writing, meeting, but all of these other things as well to make sure that you are getting paid a, a fair rate that both you and your clients are happy with. So with that, we will catch you guys in the next episode. Bye everybody. Like what you heard? Hit subscribe so you never miss a video. And if you're ready to take the first step toward becoming a copywriter yourself, sign up for a free video training right here.